You are now listening to the Minority Entrepreneur and Trailblazers Podcast, and I'm your host, Greg E. Hill, the culture change agent. On this show, we interview young, successful minorities in a variety of fields to educate, empower, and inspire our current and future generations of leaders. And I am incredibly, incredibly excited today to interview our featured guest. Currently, she's the Director of Human Resources at Public Preparatory Network. Uh, prior to that, she was Director of Operations at Girls Prep, located in Lower East Side Manhattan, where she also coaches the middle school girls basketball team. She's an adjunct professor at Baruch College, located in New York as well. She's a woman of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. <laughs> She's a part of the board of directors of the Percy Julian STEM Charter School. She was voted one of the top 10 educators to look out for in New York City. Um, most importantly, she's a North Carolina A&T Aggie alum. And she graduated from a little school called Harvard University. Um, so without further ado, let's let's welcome Emily Christopher to the show. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me, Greg. No, uh, that, no problem. Thank you for giving us your time. And before I dig in, I, I want to kind of let the audience know about how we do our show, right? The first phase, we talk about your story, what you do, and we get a little bit personal because we really want to understand kind of what you do and, and, and how did you get to this point? Um, the second phase of the show is more story driven and more actionable. So say if I'm a young adult in college, high school, or my young professional, um, we could take actionable advice. I, I think I plan in the future. We're going to talk about the future. Um, of a, in, in your case, education, what you have planned next, and kind of some of the future goals. And then we have our rapid fire round where we ask questions. And then we wrap it up. So you excited? This sounds like a wonderful plan. <laughs> so I'm going to throw the ball back in your court. Um, please introduce yourself to the audience. Explain what you do and uh, give us a little background. All right. So, I mean, you, after that wonderful intro, I'm not sure what else left to say, but uh, <laughs> full name is Emily Christopher, um, native of North Carolina, currently living in Brooklyn, New York, uh, living and loving New York City right now, currently working in HR. Uh, so I kind of feel like this is the right space at the right time for me, where everything is kind of coming together at the right time. And I'm beginning to really get to work on what I would identify as my passion. So helping people and really looking at systems uh, that surround education. I'd say for me, as far as like where I am right now, life is great. Spending time with family, friends, you know, can't complain at all. Getting to do all types of work, like you explained, working at Baruch College, working with different schools, working with different organizations. Um, and just very excited about what's next to come for me and, you know, staying in touch with great people like you. Got you, got you, got you, great. <laughs> got you, man. So before we kind of dig a little deeper into kind of your, your past and, and what you do now, we're going to start this thing off with a quote because um, for anybody that knows me or friends with me that has my phone number, I am the biggest quote guy in the world. I mean, every morning I wake up at 430, that's when I usually do my running or I do my writing and I send out quotes to my friends and I really think you have to start your day off with that positive energy and I want to bring that same energy to this podcast. So, Emily, give me I, I need your your one of your favorite quotes and give me your story how you <laughs> apply it into your everyday life. Mm. So, so, one, I need to be added to your list of quotes, please and thank you. <laughs> um, two, it uh, the quote that I have is something that um I really just truncated and used the end of it, but I'm going to give you guys the full quote and then walk you through what it means to me. Um, but for me, it's all about how you're using what you've been given. Um, a lot of your God-given talents. So, so this quote I have is from Irma Bombeck. Uh, it says, when I stand before God at the end of my life, I would hope that I would not have a single bit of talent left and could say, I use everything you gave me. Uh, for me, it really exemplifies being able to be a vessel to support and help others, um, but also being able to do something that I love every single day, being able to help people every single day, being able to help future generations by working within the education system every single day and being able to feel completely tapped out in a very good way at the end of each workday, knowing that I am able to go in, do what I love and give everything that God gave me to give on a daily basis. And I think for you know a lot of people who may be unsure of what their path is, who may be unsure of what you know, you've been called to do, a lot of it is is at the end of the day when you're done, how do you feel? Mm -hmm. Do you feel good about what you've done? Do you feel good about who you've helped? Do you, did you help anybody? Um, 
And so for me, it's like, it's like it's, you go all in. You work as hard as you can, as best you can, as smart as you can, and you give it all you got. And then at the end of the day, you should be able to go home and feel good and say, you know, almost like I did that. Wow. And I did that very well. Wow. Um, and I try to do that every single day. Wow. And, and how old are you, um, M? I am 27 so years old. At 27, and I know sidebar you never ask a female how old you is and i know i just broke the <laughs> common law so please forgive me everybody at him but <laughs> but at 27 years old you have found your your passion your calling and your purpose in life i mean of course you have bigger and better things ahead but still you found that so i know there's a lot of young adults a lot of people in college and high school still trying to find their way and find out what, what their strengths are, what they're passionate about, what they're really calling on earth to do. So uh, since you've been able to find it, mm -hmm. what are some things that, that we could do to find out what we need to be? So I think the nerd in me is always about finding an assessment. Mm -hmm. um, and I can honestly say there was something that I engaged in when I was about 19, 20 years old that shifted my trajectory for what I wanted to do in life. Um, when I was 19, 20 years old, I was able to become a Thurgood Marshall Scholar. Um, I got the opportunity through ANT. Uh, shout out to Denise Iverson Payne for helping me get that. And I was a, I got involved with a lot of their programs. And one of their programs actually had me sent out for a summer for about, a, I think it was a two-week period, to Lincoln, Nebraska, where I had never been before. And I have never seen that many cornfields in my life. <laughs> uh, but it was a, a Gallup learning experience. And so if, for those who don't know, Gallup is an organization that does a lot of data analysis, but Gallup also produces a line of books and materials and resources um, that are about you. leadership development. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I was engaged in this, um, it was like the GLI, Gallup Leadership Institute. And I was there for a couple of weeks with a, a group of peers, 20 people, all of us complete strangers, had this learning experience experience came together and now a lot of us are even still friends. Um, so during that, we took the Strengths Finder 2.0. Strengths Finder is an amazing book. It's by Tom Rath. I use it with a lot of the youth that I work with. I use it with my teams when I work on the job because for me, it gave me language to talk about what I was good at and what I like to do. And one thing that I find is that we as a people, not just a people of color, but young people in general, we're so trapped up in what's going on with social media and everything being such a quick fix that we don't spend a lot of time looking at ourselves mm -hmm. from a, a, a self, like a critical self analysis type of way. Like we look at ourselves in terms of like, I can take the best selfie. We look at ourselves in terms of, you know, when somebody's listening to me or I post a picture, I get a bunch of likes. That's great. But that's not really indicative of who you are as a person. And so when I took this Strength Finder 2.0 assessment, I was able to kind of step back and it, it really gave me language to be able to talk about who I was. And it almost to an extent kind of scared me when I took it because I was reading it. I was reading my results and I'm like, how does this person know how I think? And how do they know what I think I know about myself? So when I first took that assessment, it was a really reflective time frame for me because I had a chance to step back, think about what I had done so far in my undergraduate career, which, you know, I, I had played basketball at a and I was, you know, thinking about like, what if I want to be a captain for the team? How do I lead my teammates? I was a leader of an organization at A&T as well, uh, peer advising leadership. And so I'm beginning to see myself in a, in a different light as, a, as an individual, as a young woman, as a leader, but didn't have the language to talk about it. And so once I took that assessment, it took me down a path of, of self-discovery where I wanted to figure out what am I good at? You know, I, I, people are naturally drawn to me, but why? And this helped me really figure out why, because I, it, it helped me understand that there is a lot of authenticity to what I love to do and why I do what I do on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm doing it for attention. It's the natural way that I function and that I am. Mm -hmm. um, and by being able to kind of get to the root of who I am and who I want to be and who I want to be identified as, it's kind of set the tone for me as I go through different stages in my life for me to make hard decisions. Um, I'd say one of the hardest decisions I had to make that really helped define who I was, that helped me think through what I wanted to do next was when I quit the basketball team, actually, at A&T. Mm. And I thought about, you know, everyone knows me as the, the, the green eyed basketball player. Like, what am I going to do now? Um, but because I had taken this time to have this self-reflection, I, I really was like, no, there's a lot more that I could be doing aside from playing basketball right now. There's a lot more that I could be doing aside from just doing, you know, 
know, once a month or once a quarter community service activities or a lot more that I could be doing that's going to help impact my, me as an individual, but also help in future generations, which has always been what my natural theme has been. I've always been like a babysitter. And I've always wanted to go to like libraries and read to kids. Mm-hmm. It's always been about helping bigger, more people, but I didn't have the language. I knew I just did it because I liked it. Mm-hmm. And so after doing this assessment, I was able to start linking the pieces together. I'd say a big piece of me in my self-discovery was also my advisor while I was at A&T, Dr. Thurman Guy. He's been like a bedrock since I started working with him when I was quitting the basketball team. Um, you know, when I was quitting, I was thinking I had to quit school and start over. He helped me get a job on campus working for him, which as a part of like the exchange, he used me as almost like a, like a, like a, like a test monkey for like a his case study. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would, I don't, I would even say it was like that nice. He literally was like, I'm going to try this on you and this <laughs> and this. And I was like, okay, we're just experimenting all these new things that he wants to do. One of those was a professional development and learning plan. Um, and it was his first year of doing it. And I was literally the first person that had one with him and him and I sat down and I literally that like, it was on that day. I think it was like a, it was in December of 2000 and, uh, 11 that I sat down with him and I actually like, it was the first time that I wrote out, I want to go to graduate school. It was the first time I sat there and wrote out, I want to work in education. The first time I sat and wrote out, I want to do, you know, I want to work in, in, in urban education. And lo and behold, like he recently, he sent me that document back and I was like, wow, I actually did those things. And so I think it was a matter of like finally getting the language that I needed to really feel self secure having the right people in my life at the right times to help connect the dots and then having, you know, that those people are also my own, you know, integrity and my own uh, like self-concept built to a stage where I knew whatever I wanted to do was going to be my choice. And now I'm at a place, you know, I'd say, I think after my 25th birthday, I was like, so from here on out, I'm just going to do what I want to do. And if I want to quit stuff, I'm going to quit stuff. And if I want to pick something else up, I'm going to pick something else up. And that's just how I'm going to rock. And since then, I've made it a point to only do things that I want to do, because there's no point in me spending my energy, my resources, my time, my my spirit, my love to do things that I don't really want to do. And it's been it's been amazing that when you're true to yourself, the pieces fall into place. It's a very hard thing to translate for other people. I think that I've been very fortunate you know, in what I've been given, um, who I've been able to touch, who I've been able to work with. And the only thing I, I do, always try to tell them is like, just do what you want to do. Like, wow. Despite your parents, despite, you know, your peers, you should be marching to the beat of your own drum. And until you get to the point where you're able to do that and feel okay doing it, because people will say they, that they do it, but then they, they have remorse and they're like, oh, somebody's going to judge me. Until you get to the point where you really are just doing what you feel is best for you and you, you know, when you pray about it, it's what your spirit says is the right thing to do. You, I feel, To me, you won't be successful. Oh my. And you have to get to that point where you know what's best for you and you have people around you that believe in you and encourage you to do what's best for you. And I've been very fortunate in being able to have that. Man, like I, I don't even want to release it to the public. I want to package this into a CD <laughs> and sell this for a hundred dollars. This is a, a life coaching. This is a, a, oh my goodness. This is a, I, I will not lie. I've had a lot of people in, in this show so far, but that dialogue right there, hit on some of the biggest points ever. And I want to bring three points that I drew from and out. Um, the first is finding the verbiage for your strength. Cause you didn't just say, okay, find a strength. No, 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 no. Finding a verbiage because you see it all the time in the, the educational system. And even growing up, how many times, and I want to audience people to close your eyes. How many times did your parents say, Hey son, you're good at this. Or Hey daughter, you're, you're good at this. Or a teacher pull you aside and say, you have a knack for this. It doesn't happen too often. You know <laughs> when uh, you you didn't clean the dishes or you don't listen in class or you're not paying attention or you get a bad grade. You know all that stuff. But how many times do you really, really understand what your strength is? And uh, either A, somebody could tell you, or B, you could look at resources like a strength finder to, for them to tell you. And, and the crazy thing about it is... I have my strength finance test pulled up right now because I did it a couple years ago. Um, my <laughs> life, my life coach, um, he advised me to take it, and it's been probably just as transformative as yours, Emily, because I had futuristic, intellection, strategic, achiever, maximizer, and it gives you a full breakdown on how each one applies to your life. And it's like, this is crazy. So for all you young people out there, for all you guys really trying to find your strength. Don't, don't, I mean, if, if if you ask your peer group and they can tell you, 
use tools and strength finder and it will be in my show notes is one of them and i think you hit on a huge huge thing um as well you your your coach and your advisor at the time had you write down where you saw yourself at and that is so important as far as physically taking the time to think and write down where you want to be. How do you want to do it? I cannot preach that enough that if you write it down, your probability of hitting that goal, hitting that point is, is, I mean, Harvard did a study on it. It's almost 90% more plausible than if you writing it down or you just thinking. And I mean, think about it. 87% uh, of Americans don't even write down their goals or just, and, and 70% don't even have goals. So the fact that you're writing it down is so important. Like, man, I just want to re-record what you just said. We can just end the interview right now to be real. <laughs> oh, I just want to piggyback what you're saying. I think that the writing it out is key. And I'd say people of color, we don't, one, write enough. Two, we're not writing the right things. Mm -hmm. We write about the things that are superficial. We and and one thing that I am also a huge advocate of is vision boards. Mm. Um, you know, the book The Secret talks about it a lot, and I think that's another book that when I first got the Strength Finder 2.0, the next book that I kind of leaned toward was The Secret, and that book. And I watched the documentary as well; it's available on Netflix for free. Mm. Um, well, if you have a Netflix account, it's available. <laughs> but you can live stream that and watch it because it's, it's the it's not just the power of saying it; it's the power of writing it and seeing it is when those two things come together, then that's when you have real transformative change within the way you think about what can happen to you. Because you can put, the, you can sit there and talk about how you want, you know, a million dollars, you want a million dollars, you want a million dollars. But until you start actually writing it out and then seeing it and creating the visual of like, okay, this can be a reality. That's when you start to actually backwards map what needs to actually happen mm -hmm. for you to get there. The biggest thing about when I was writing that plan when I was a sophomore, you know, sophomore going on junior at a and was that we wrote down what I wanted to do. But then like once I wrote it like, and it's almost like like saying it. Yeah, there's some accountability in that. But writing it, that's maximum accountability where now you can see it. Yeah, you can destroy the sheet of paper, but, you know, you wrote that down, mm -hmm. which means that you need to make a, com a commitment to yourself to actually do it. And so like the phase two of when I wrote that plan was that him and I then sat down and we backwards math. So by the time I was midway through my my junior year, I was already researching grad schools. And him and I are sitting down talking about what do we put in a personal statement? Or where can I go to find a program that'll help me prepare for the GRE? Mm. And so you can't just have a, a, an epiphany on a whim and say, I want to do this and not put the actual realistic time-bound perspective to it. Because I think that's how we set ourselves up for failure when it comes to goal setting. Mm -hmm. We decide that we want to do something, but don't realistically say what it's going to take. So many kids I, that, that come through my schools, I want an A on the test. I want an A on the test. I want an A on the test. Day before the test, have you studied? No. So you want this to happen, but you're not putting in the work that it takes to get you to where you need to go. So you can, it, it's, it's critical that you not just, you know, write it out, but you, you take the time to also reflect and think about what it's going to actually take you to get there. Because the worst thing you can do is start setting yourself up for goals that don't work. And then that deters you from setting more goals. Yeah. And so yeah. the structure in which you put in place to actually set your goals is really. That's that's key. Really we could we could talk about that for days. And I'm I'm just listening. I'm so. Let's transition into the next part of our show where we kind of delve into okay. the how you get there and some actionable advice. And I want to kind of talk about your experience getting into harvard university because um <laughs> like that's that's crazy coming from ant and your mind shift your junior year and you're just a you're just a, a african-american girl with green eyes that hooped in ant from raleigh north carolina and all of a sudden <laughs> you you you, you went to harvard university so kind of i know you talked about it a little bit but kind of walk us through a why did you decide harvard and then b like how did you get in <laughs> <laughs> So I would say it's an interesting story because when I was making my list of all the schools I wanted to go to with my, with my supervisor um, and my mentor, Harvard was not even on the list. Um, I didn't find Harvard. Harvard found me. So mm. it was a matter of when I took my GRE, um, I, you know, I made an appointment through, through my planning. I attended a summer program after my junior year that, and I did, I went to this program specifically because they offer, and it was a minority-based program, but they offer GRE prep courses. Mm -hmm. And I do not like standardized tests. So I knew if I can get some way to get a prep course in my life, I wanted to do it. 
the program offered it and I was getting a paid stipend for doing the work I was doing over that summer. So I was like, perfect, bang this out. Took the GRE and I was applying to the other schools that I wanted to go to and I wanted to go. And I was looking for programs in school psychology um, and education, like mm-hmm. educational and school psychology. So I hadn't even looked at Harvard because they didn't have that program. I actually didn't look at any Ivy League schools. Um, my parents went to an Ivy League school. That's where they met. And, you know, for me, I was just like, meh, I don't see what I want at those schools. So I'm making sure that I focus on and follow doing whatever I want to do. I'm not going to go to school just for the name. Mm-hmm. So I started doing more research over my senior year. And I started realizing how interested I actually was, not just in ed psychology, but in education policy. So I started expanding my list a little bit, but still Harvard wasn't on the list. I think I had like 15 grad schools I was applying to. It was like UCLA, IUPUI, Duke University, UNC, um, like Northwestern. Like there was like a list of schools all across the nation. I got my GRE scores back. First time I took it, bombed it. It was terrible. I really looked at my score and I was like, I think that I cannot read because my reading score was so low. <laughs> I didn't even know how to equate that into an actual score. Uh-huh. So I was like, you know what? I got to take it again. I took it again. You know, the, the math, math comes very naturally to me. So that, that part was really easy. The writing piece, I can write my butt off, you know, probably by virtue of my mother being a lawyer mm-hmm. and always making me write every single thing from the time I could even hold a pencil. Mm-hmm. Um, and her always like making me write book reports in the summer and all that nerdy stuff that I used to have to do growing up. Mm-hmm. But the reading portion always threw me for a loop because, and I think it's a part of just the way standardized tests are designed, that they aren't designed for people of color. So there are words on these tests that even if I had lived in a very, very wealthy community in the South, I wouldn't know because culturally I'm not exposed to certain things. Mm-hmm. And so after taking the test over again, I got my score back and I was like, okay, I can live with this score. It was a passing score for the majority of the schools that I applied to. All of a sudden I get an email from Harvard inviting me to apply. And I'm like, what? Why would I go there? I, was th- I literally got an email from Harvard and I was like, it was like based off of your GRE score, we think you'd be a, a candidate for XYZ programs. Somehow, I guess by the way I filled out the information, there was like a profile that was created that was blasted out to a bunch of different schools. So I'm over here like, this is a little creepy, but okay, why not? I'll do some research. Start doing research. And I was like, wow, they have an education policy and management program. Start researching the actual courses involved. And I'm like, this is actually very much aligned to where I could see myself going if I went an education policy route. So, you know, took it. I didn't tell my parents yet, took it, prayed about it. And I was like, is this, would this be a great match for me? And I'm like, you know, they came and found me. I didn't find them, you know? And then it was like, like, you know what, why not? And I think a part of it was like the self doubt started to creep in. Like I can't get into Harvard. Like, like, come on. I mean, I know I'm smart, but like, these are the people that go to Harvard. Like I'm not like them. Um, and, and, you know, I, and then I finally was like, mom, what do you think about this? We had a conversation about it and I was like, okay. She was like, why? She's like, I don't see why not. Like, you're more than capable. And I was like, I get it. I know I'm capable, but like, is this what I want to do? Like, is this the legacy I want to leave? So I took the information after talking to my mom. She's like sounding bored. Didn't talk to my dad. My dad would be like, yeah, to whatever I say do. It's daddy's girl. The youngest, the only girl. <laughs> He's going to do whatever I ask him to do. Uh-huh. So then I took that to my to my mentor that I had been working with. And he got excited. And I was like, mm, if he's getting excited, then I think I should get excited. Because... I think there was something just very special about not just being, not just getting that email, but also seeing the alignment and what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And then also seeing how, when I kind of stepped back and looked at that plan I put together, how in looking at my longer term goals, Mm -hmm. this could set me up so much better than some of the other schools that I was applying to would. And so literally like one thing came after the next and I was like, all right, forget it. I'm going to apply. My oldest brother, who has also been a rock for me, Pay for my application fee because it was ridiculous. Um, and, you know, I submitted everything by the deadline. My supervisor wrote me a great letter of recommendation, as well as a couple other people who I've been, been in touch with. And everything got in on time. And there was the, the you know, the agonizing waiting period. And I started getting acceptance letters back and I hadn't heard from Harvard yet. Um, it got to the point where I was looking at, I was seriously looking at going to UCLA because they were offering me a full ride to their educational psychology program. Um, within their grad school of education and like in information studies, something like that. Um, and so I was like, you know, do I want to go to UCLA? I'm not sure. I was like, you know what? To make my decision, I should book a flight and go out there. And I always suggest for some of my students that I work with now, if you can go on a visit, go on a visit. Mm-hmm. Because it's not just a matter of do they have what you want, but also can you see yourself working with those people and living in that culture and that environment? Mm-hmm. So at right, literally right after I booked my stuff to go visit UCLA, 
I got an acceptance email from Harvard. Wow. And I was like, ooh, God's saying something. And I knew I had a very tight timeline. So the way it was like, it'll work out is that, and my dad, again, anything I ask, he says yes. I was like, dad, this is what we need to do. We need to go see to UCLA, spend three days in LA, meeting the people, talking to them. And then we need to fly across the country so I can go see Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> That's what and, happens when both your parents go to Ivy League schools. You can play and stuff like that. <laughs> well, I mean, and my, and my dad, the thing about him is that he, he's always owned his own business. And so he could take off the time and mm. do that. Um, my mom wouldn't be able to do it. But my dad was like, okay, yeah, let's do this. Because for them, it was very, very important for me to have, you know, to do what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but to also have the chance to see it before I made a decision. Because it's a very big investment either way. Either it's I invest four to five years of my life in LA. Yes, it'd be paid for, but it's four to five years. Or I invest like a large lump sum of money for 10 months of my life, which will also be a very life-changing experience. Mm-hmm. Long story short, got to visit both campuses. As soon as I as soon as I got off the T, which is the train in Boston, as soon as I got off the T and walked into Harvard Square, I was like, Dad, this is where I belong. Talk to some people went into some classrooms, just sat around the campus. And I was like, hands down, this is where I want to be for a year. I will make the commitment. I will take out the loan, whatever I got to do. This is where I want to go. A month later, I was moving to Boston. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's, that's just so amazing, man. That's, that's I'm, and I'm not even going to distort the story by trying to bring out takeaways. I mean, if you, this is a podcast, so you can you can rewind it back. But that's so powerful and transformative about just writing down your goals and seeing it all come to fruition. And then also, I think the secret talks about it too: the law of attraction. You put exactly. a lot of positive energy in the air. You made the steps. You made the commitments, and then things came out of nowhere to you. Like Harvard just said, "Hey," exactly. came out of nowhere. Like sending an email. We think you'd be a good applicant. You didn't know that, but. You put in so much positive energy into the mark, into the world, and and you let the world and everything around you feel what you were trying to do, and, mm-hmm. and look how it just came to you. That's crazy. And I think a part of it is also like just like the surprise, like the sheer shock when I got to the school, and I had met some people, but not all of them. And I I kind of think that when they saw my application, and all that stuff, like yeah, they saw African American, but they were like, she got to be mixed. So when I showed up, they were like, oh wait, she's actually a black girl. Mm-hmm. It was just even more exciting because I was like, yes, and I'm here to take over your campus. And it was interesting. I talked to um, Dr. Judy Rashida at A and T after I got accepted and decided to go there because she was helping me make the decision. And this much she told me that I'll never forget. She was like, your job when you go there is to direct quote, direct quote, rape, pillage, and steal. And I looked at her and I was like, you want me to rape people at Harvard? Like, I'm <laughs> here. She was like, your job as a woman of color going to this school is to go and get all the resources that you can and bring them back to your people. Mm-hmm. She was like, you were chosen to do this for a reason. This came to you for a reason. This was not just happenstance of, oh, you're smart, you get to go. Because a lot of smart people apply there every single year. Your name was pulled out of that hat. Your application was pulled for whatever reason for a specific reason. And so when you go there, don't waste this experience. You need to go rape, pillage, and steal and bring back all the resources and knowledge that you can to move us as a people forward. And so it's just reaffirming things that I get like that from my support network that help me understand that this is the right thing to do. And like you said, like putting out that positive energy keeps those people around me that helps me know that and keep and feel reassured that what I'm doing is the right thing. That's 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 huge. And that's huge. And and I mean, it really, really hits to emotional core of me because there was a time in my life where I've been uh, had the outrageous opportunity to be in uh, two of the best minority leadership development programs in the country. I worked for General Let I worked from some top companies, intern and work full time for. Them. And I've always and in a day, I mean, growing up. Always wanted to kind of be a hardcore guy, but I was smart. God afforded me a lot of opportunities that they were pushing in my hand, and I was like, "Well, for the longest, I used to neglect all those opportunities, and um, and I would I would do that, but I wouldn't fully invest it. But then one day, realized like Greg, it, you being an African American male, of course, with these opportunities, you have it's your responsibility to make the most out of each and every one. It's, you don't have an option." It's like you don't have an option yep. to be like, okay, I, I got a sixty, seventy thousand dollars job. I can just chill and rest on my lords. No, your obligation for this community, for the people that died for this opportunity to get there, 
is to give back and reap it to the community. And that's powerful that you had such guidance and the, the, the skill set to know how to realize that not only were you going to go and dominate Harvard, get your degree and do amazing things, but you felt that responsibility to society, to your culture, to really take every single thing you learn and then give it right back. And that's why I'm glad we're, we started this podcast to give the things that we learned throughout the years to give it right back to everybody else. Exactly. Um, and I and before we kind of go into the futuristic round, I have one question, and I think it kind of rolls into what you just asked. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a lot of friends that are in corporate America doing amazing things, making great money, but I feel as if this hard, like they they want to give back and they want to help out. But what is the best way they can use their talents to 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 really add value to community? Like, for instance, say I'm a consultant, right? Mm-hmm. I make around eighty thousand dollars a year. Do you think my best way of giving back is just join Big Brothers Big Sister, or what way do you think I can really use my skill set to add value to the community? Well, I think a lot of that is dependent on what you believe your skill sets are. Mm-hmm. So, me, I love mentoring. So, being engaged in mentoring programs and and is is critical to me. But some people say I love mentoring, but then don't want to spend the time with these kids to actually talk to them. And so you have to figure out what is your niche as far as being a volunteer. Is it that you have a net you want to help out with like financial literacy? Okay, don't be a mentor. You should probably talk to some organizations that talk to youth or talk to, you know, people without jobs about financial literacy. Don't try to pigeonhole yourself and say, oh, I got to be a mentor. That's the only way to give back. There are so many different avenues to give back that it it takes a little bit of legwork Mm -hmm. to do your own research, because I think a big part of it. Again, that like we don't do like we don't want to read, we don't want to write. We want people to just tell us what to do. You can't. If you're trying to figure out what your path is, what your desire is, to how you're going to impact the world, it takes you doing some work and doing some critical thinking. I know for me, like, and I, I've had experience where I wanted to give back and like I failed because it was not something that I was interested in. I wasn't aligned, and because it's also the mission alignment piece. Like, you can't just don't go, just don't just look in in a phone book and like run your finger down the page and be like, all right, this one. You need to make sure that you're actually aligned with what these organizations are doing, because otherwise you're going to waste your time and their time. And similar to the experience that a lot of people have when, you know, they write a goal, it doesn't work out. You have one bad experience volunteering somewhere, it doesn't work out. You're like, I should never do that again. And we don't want that to happen. So really spend the time to figure out what your niche is, what you enjoy doing. Because really, for me, I feel good enough when somebody in corporate America will at least spend the time to come to a career day. Mm-hmm. Like just be an example from a distance. If that's if it's not meant for you to be in that classroom and go over math problems with children, don't force yourself to do that because you're wasting a child's time and you're wasting your time. But if you're able to go in and just once a year talk to some kids about the work that you've done, talk to some kids about your path and what you you know what, what you've learned, you never know how that one interaction can transform a child's life or a young person's life. So take some time and think about what is your niche? Your niche could literally be like, you have a knack for wanting to help homeless people and you like food. So why not go volunteer at a food pantry? You don't have, and, like, and I feel like everybody's like, I gotta be a mentor, I gotta be a mentor. You don't have to be a mentor. There's so many ways to help. So figure out what you love doing. Like, what do you find yourself walk roaming up and down the streets? Like I, in New York, I think about it, especially because we spend so much time, I'm just like out and about, right? Everything's on the trains. You know, you're you're getting off at a station. You see like people break dancing, mm-hmm. and you're interested. You like that. So why don't you break dance and do it for some fundraising money for an organization that you believe in? Mm. Why not? You know, if you like to go out to farmers markets, why not get involved with some of the some of the food banks in the city that work on getting some of the fresh foods to the lower income areas where they don't have fresh vegetables and fruits every single day for the kids. Figure out what you love to do. And like I said, like, like what I do, I don't do anything I don't love to do. <laughs> so it's really hard for me. Like, I'm like, why would I spend time doing something I don't believe in? I feel like a lot of people spend a lot of time doing things they don't believe in. We have to shift that paradigm because I don't want to ever teach my child to do something that they don't love. That's wow. where we run into the most societal issues because why would I ever want you to spend time, the only resource you can never get back, doing something you don't like to do? That builds resentment. It builds laziness. It does not help anybody. Until we get to the point where people are able to really identify what they're interested in, align that with different types of organizations that are out there, and then start creating action, it's going to be very difficult to be involved because no one's going to come to you with all the answers. You have to go out there, find what you're know what you're interested in, 
find out who's doing it. And that will enable you to really figure out, okay, this is how I can get engaged. And you'll be much more satisfied doing it. Man, that you hit her on the head. And if I didn't get anything out of our whole conversation today, the one thing I will get and that I'm going to think about when we get off this line is not doing anything I don't want to do. (laughs) <laughs> and, and to be real, I mean, and, and not to say that, all right, kids in high school, don't be like, well, I don't like school. Let me just drop out. No. I mean, some stuff you have to do, but until you earn that right. You didn't just say it at 17, oh, I don't want to do this. No. You said at 25, I, I put in the hard work, I put in the time, I've really created momentum. Now I can just say, what do I want to do, right? Yep. Gotcha. And a lot of it a lot of it relates to that quote that I, I love so much from the great debaters. You have to do, you know, you do what you have to do to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. So there are certain steps that you need to take. Of course, I'm not saying, you know, 15, I don't want to go to school, so I'm not going to do it. No. You need to figure out from a bigger picture, what are the steps that you want? It's like you start with the macro level, bring it down. So it's like, what are the things that you want for yourself in life? All right. In order to get those things, what are the necessary steps you have to take? All right. Within those necessary steps. What are the things that you love the most? Because if everything is aligned with that bigger picture, then doing what you want to do becomes a great idea. Hey, I got a couple more questions. If you had to tell Emily Christopher something 10 years ago, what would you tell her? Knowing what you know now. So Emily Christopher at 17. I would tell her, follow your heart. Because I I can honestly say that there's nothing that I've done that I regret because I feel like I've learned so much from everything that I've done, both the good, the bad, the mistakes, the mess ups. I would tell myself to follow my heart. Mm, That's that's good. And at the end of the day, when when it's our time, as everybody listening to this podcast would do, we have to go back in the box. What type of legacy do you want to leave behind? Mm, that's a tricky one. So it gets deep. I, de- <laughs> I definitely want to be someone that, you know, it to me, do I want my name remembered by millions of people? It's always sounds nice, but in reality, not really. Um, I, I like to keep my circle of influence, you know, broad yet close knit. Um, you know, I want, I'd rather prefer, I prefer to stay narrow and go deep than to be super broad, super wide and be shallow. Mm -hmm. So I'd I'd say I want my legacy to be someone who wholeheartedly, you know, believed in the American education system and the capacity of what we could do as a society and work diligently to set our future generations up for success as it pertains to, um, you know, their options for, for their lives. Mm. Now, like if like at the end of the day, if that's what I can go to God and say I gave it all I got, that's what I want him to say. You did that and you made sure that you helped out other people um, directly relating to the way that the education system works. Man, wow. Let's let's transition to our last round. And that is our uh, what I call the culture change round. But we're going to ask around five questions and we're going to ask you a rapid answer. You just off off the top of your head. And and, and these. uh, Yeah, we'll go from there. What okay. is the best piece of advice you ever received? Great pillage and steel. And <laughs> <laughs> I take that honestly, I take that into everybody. I feel like every situation I go into, there's something to learn that I can bring back and help people that I know. Mm, powerful. What is one of your personal habits that you can attribute to your success? My insatiable uh, appetite for knowledge. Um, I'm always asking questions, always trying to figure out why things are happening and so that once I learn the why, I can figure out how they can be done better. Mm, powerful. What is your favorite book and why? My favorite book would be a book called The Last Lecture. Um, I've never heard of that. A book that Dr. Guy gave me. It's actually the story of a professor uh, from a school in the north, in the Midwest. I can't remember his name specifically. I think it was Randy Poe. He wrote the book. Um, and he was dying of cancer when he wrote the book. And it talks about... about almost like the legacy piece, like what would you do and why? Um, a book that I frequently reference along with The Secret and Strengths Finder 2.0. Mm. 
great books, great books, and audience. We'll have the links to all these books and great resources in the show notes. Um, what inspires you and keeps you motivated? My family. Um, one thing that I, I love probably more than life itself is my niece and nephews and my goddaughter um, wanting to be a great example for them. Is I think what really fuels me every single day. You know, I'm up here in New York. My family's in the South and on the West Coast. Um, but wanting to really be a great person to show them that despite what society is showing you, despite what social media is saying, despite what the media is saying, that you can still be your own person. And in doing that, you can be very happy. Mm, powerful, powerful, powerful. And um, to wrap up the culture change round. If you were the president of the United States, what is the first thing you would do? Ooh. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. President Christopher <laughs> would that. open with, you know, you got to speak to his distance, right? Yeah. Um, I would probably open up my presidency by doing some like nationwide roundtables. Um, going to all types of cities, bringing different types of people together and just kind of hearing what's out there and bringing my key leaders and role players to those meetings to really hear what's happening on the ground to start my my term off by helping people kind of see what the work looks like on the ground um, and the impact of our work. I think sometimes, especially when you're so high up, you tend to be able to lose sight of what's actually going on and what the implications of your actions are. Um, and then try to work in a, in a silo or like they say in the education space, you know, you're, you're working in like the, the, the castle by yourself. You're up there by yourself. Um, so definitely do some, some work trying to just figure out what's happening in the landscape. Hear some real voices and make sure that I'm just not the only one at the table, but other key decision makers are at the table to help inform decision-making and shift the culture of the bureaucracy that is our, um, national presidential offices and the, just the, the, the entire de- the sector of the departments in the governmental uh, sector. Boom, boom, boom. And that's a wrap for the culture change round. And now we have our last final question and we wrap up the show. And like I said, I'm the culture change agent. That's Greg Kidd. That's my moniker. And this last question revolves around that. If you could change one thing about society, most specifically, African American culture. What would it be, and why? That we all love to read. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my mom once telling me, and I've also heard it from other people who are important to me in my life. Um, and I was told this when I was young: if you want to hide something from a black person, put it in a book. Mm-hmm. And I was immediately offended when I heard that because I like reading. I love reading. Um, too. But then I realized how true it was because so many of us don't read. And there's so much great information that is in books that have been written. But there's also a lot of critical information that's shared with us that we just choose not to read and therefore we don't know. And we try to act like because no one told me, it doesn't apply. Wow. That's powerful. I'm Chris, man. It's been a, a pleasure. A pleasure talking to you and, and giving your time and your knowledge, your advice, your 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 stories. And I definitely think we have a lot to take away from this thing. So one, I, I just want to say thank you from our listeners, from me, and from everybody involved. No, I, I want to thank you for the time. This was a really great experience. And, you know, I do hope that it helps. Um, I know there are a lot of great listeners out there who may be seeking guidance or just you know, need some additional encouragement. And I hope I was able to help provide some of that. And, you know, and if in the future, I hope to be a resource for people too, if they need it. Yeah, definitely. So that, that lies to where can people find more information about you, what you're doing or be able to contact you? Yeah. I mean, I'm always open and available to, you know, help people out. So, you know, email emily.christopher at gmail.com. Um, you can also, if you're looking out on social media, I'm on Facebook. Uh, you can also check me out on Twitter underscore emily09 and also on instagram at emily09 got you got you got you well um that is really all we have for the show i mean it's been an amazing time amazing time as I, I like i said thank you again and we'll catch you on the flip side all right greg have a great one thank you so much